Let's get started here with this uh, review of membranes again. Um, I just wanted to come back just to point out uh, two points from the prior class and then we'll move on to the new stuff. I had mentioned here membranes um, are used in a variety of areas and one of the things that where we see them in context is looking at how nature separates and trying to mimic that. And membranes are really an effective um, synthetic way that we've tried to replicate the ability of nature to nature's work. Um, there was an interesting article I just read this uh, this week um, in Nature, Nature Nanomaterials, where um, one of the goals of scientists is to create an adhesive that works underwater. Right? So this would have tremendous applications in bioengineering. It would have great applications in medicine if you could create an adhesive that works underwater. And so what these scientists at MIT did was to basically mimic the way algae and shellfish and mussels grow underwater and find those same proteins that those, part of, that those animals and plants express. So we often do this, we see this over and over in science, is trying to replicate what nature does, but then we take that and then try to improve it in some way. And so that's what we're going to see here in the membrane topic, right? Membranes exist all around us in nature, but can we enhance the separation ability? And we're going to do that by putting high pressures through the, through the membrane and try to make that membrane as thin as possible. I had said last class, um, a really promising career is out there for anyone that's interested in membranes and particularly solving these problems. These are not solved, okay? So on Wednesday's class, we're going to have Sean Johnson here. Sean was a student in 4M two years ago. He's graduated now and works at GE Water. Um, GE Water bought out Xenon. Xenon was a company that was started by a McMaster professor um, in the 70s. And their, this company works with membrane and water treatment. So Sean. Uh, who now is, works at GE, will come give a talk, and he'll actually create a membrane for you here in class. So he's going to do that and show you a very basic membrane, but GE spends a lot of money. They have a whole wall of patents in their offices in Burlington that shows how they've tried to deal with a number of these problems over the past few decades. Um, so there's a really good career there and interesting work for anyone that's interested in that topic. Now, let's also look at the money side of this. Um, this data is about 10 years out of date, but it still gives us a good idea of the ranking, at least, of the various segments of membrane filtration. So dialysis is by far the largest um, market, um, certainly because of healthcare dollars being available there for it. So it's in the order of $2,000 million per year. This was back in 2005. So it's grown, it's a mature market growing at 5%. But what's really interesting is if you look at all the others, water treatment, water treatment, water treatment, water treatment, water treatment. Okay? No surprise. Engineers, our biggest goals over the, our lifetime is water, energy, food. Okay, those three areas, if you're working in those three areas, you're guaranteed work, water, energy, and food. And here we see that in membranes. And these are growing market segments. So reverse osmosis, microfiltration, ultrafiltration. Um, so really, really worthwhile considering those um, as career options. And it's also why this topic is so important for us. So let's, um, let's take a look at this. Let's introduce some basic terminology. We're going to feed our material here, and this is going to be a mixture of fluid, usually water, with some solids. Either the solids are dissolved in the, in the liquid phase, so you can't see the solids, or as we'll see in today's class, the topic we're focusing on in microfiltration, those solids are visible. They're, um, they're, they're, they're part of the feed stream. They're not dissolved, but they're extremely small solids. And so the membrane is essentially, in the terms of microfiltration, is just a, just a medium. So no different to the filtration topic we've looked at over the uh, um, two weeks ago. All that a membrane is is just a sophisticated filter paper. OK? 
Okay, if you want to look at it in crude terms, that's the way we look at it, and in fact is the way we will model it. So all our equations that you'll see today are going to be identical to those from the previous classes, with just a small change. Okay, so what we, what we do then is we feed our material to the one side. The, the product, the, usually the fluid phase that passes through, we call the permeate. The part that is retained on the, the other side of the membrane is the retentate. Okay, so I'm going to pass these membranes around. Uh, these are two membranes that uh, Dr. Latulip, David Latulip, has allowed me to use from his lab. You can see the cross section over there. Feed coming through, it passes through this membrane, this, this brown core. The plastic pipe is just the container for all of this. Um, but the, the membrane is there in brown. And then we've got, um, because this is cut off, there would be a, a feed and a permeate and a retentate coming out, but ju you're just seeing one of them. So pass that around, and then here's another example. Uh, it's a bit more intact. Take a look through this side. You can see inside what it looks like, and then the perspex allows you to see a little bit more of what the membrane structure looks like. And there's ports for retentate and permeate. Okay, so two of those going around. The sweep is a... a is an optional stream that we'll sometimes add in just to kind of scour away material off the membrane. Uh, we, we won't focus on it too, too much right away, but I'll talk about it later on. So that's some of the terminology. There's a little bit more terminology we'll quickly cover here. Um, we call these membranes semi-permeable. For example, your skin is semi-permeable membrane. If you put um, creams or medicine that, that's applied as a topical medicine onto your skin, some of that is absorbed through your skin and passes through. Other particles are not allowed in through your skin. So it's allowing partial permeants, semi-permeable. The mass separating agent in the context of membranes is the membrane itself. The energy separating agent is the applied pressure that you you use to move material across the membrane. So the other term that we're going to introduce here, porosity, you've seen this word before in terms of solids, packing, but we're going to use a different um, perspective for porosity in membranes. If you consider a membrane and you unfold it and now you get a flat sheet of membrane, for example, and you took a microscope to it, you would see pores on the surface of that membrane. So you're looking at the top view, the material passes in the direction of the board through the membrane and out the other side, but there would be pores on the surface of the membrane and the porosity is simply a number that tells you the ratio of this open pore area, so the sum of the open pore areas divided by the total surface there on the board. Okay, so that's a, a number that we will sometimes see referred to. Now, back to this uh, word that has been coming up over and over in this course, flux, transfer rate over transfer area. I just want to perhaps expand a little bit on that um, in the context here. So we've seen this. I'm going to rewrite it as transfer rate. And I'm going to bring transfer area over onto the right. And then we've completed that equation by normally having these two other terms, driving force over resistance. Okay, so we've seen this several times and just re rewritten it that way. Now, flux in, in this course refers to any material that's being transferred. So it's the rate at which we're transferring it. And that transfer rate can be expressed in several ways. You could write it as moles per second. You might write it as kilograms per second. You might write it as meters cubed per second. Okay, so a molar rate, a mass flow rate, or volumetric rate. It doesn't really matter how you express that. We can always convert from one form to the other on the left-hand side. Now, I do want to emphasize this equation because all our work in this course is figuring out that transfer rate. Right? As an engineer, that is what we're concerned about. 
how fast can we move stuff through that membrane? How fast can we transfer heat through our heat exchanger? How fast can we move our reactant through a catalyst pellet in a reaction system? Right? So flux is always of interest to us. And what this equation shows us is that if we want to increase transfer rate, which is almost always the direction we want to go in, we increase our transfer area. So that's a capital cost. So if you want more stuff to happen, more stuff to flow, you buy more area, more membrane surface area. You get a larger heat exchanger. You get more catalyst particles in there. So you get a greater transfer area. Okay, so that's an easy one to, to do, but this costs capital dollars. So that's a capital expense. The driving force can also be increased. The driving force is almost always an operating expense. So you want faster flux through a membrane, you use greater delta P, a larger pressure drop. You want greater flux through your filter paper, you use a greater pressure difference. Okay, So all of that comes in terms of operating costs. So you operate your pump at faster speeds, or you apply a greater driving force. Okay. The other way that you can increase your transfer rate, of course, is to decrease your resistance. Okay, now your decrease in resistance, um, it's not always obvious if it's going to be a capital expense or an operating expense that you use to do that. It can be, in some cases it could be one, in other cases it could be the other. But having a clear identification of what your resistance is, is, is critical as well. Okay, and in membranes, your resistance Take a look at that membrane that's passing around, is how thick that membrane is. So if you can get that membrane really thin, you've decreased your resistance and you can get higher transfer rates. Right? Every single micrometer that that membrane is thicker by increases your resistance. Okay? And right there you're seeing the problem with membranes. We want faster transfer rates by using high pressure drops high transfer, high driving forces. So large delta P's. But you put a large delta P across a very thin membrane and that membrane's just going to break. Okay? So we can't get infinite transfer rates by just jacking up our delta P. We can't just go higher and higher and higher on delta P. That membrane is eventually going to fail. Okay? Conversely, we can't just make our membranes thinner and thinner and thinner to decrease our resistance because they won't be able to operate at the pressure drops needed to get material moving through the membrane. Okay, so I always say this in my classes, you don't get something for nothing, and this equation shows you exactly what those trade-offs are. Okay, so this is our principle. For a given area, we want the highest flux possible at the lowest cost. It's always gonna, we're not going to get this high flux for nothing. We're either gonna spend operating dollars or capital costs or something else down here in the denominator. Okay, so why, why did I emphasize this equation? Well, to have that discussion on money is important, but I also wanted to have that discussion because when we we're looking here in the membrane topic, I'm going to first focus on microfiltration, then ultra, and then move down this list to reverse osmosis. And essentially, what happens then is we're changing our driving forces for each one of those. So our driving forces are pressure gradients for the first few and eventually we'll move to electric fields if we're doing electrodialysis or concentration gradients that we'll see later on. Um, the other reason why I wanted to show this table here is because it indicates this difference between micro, ultra, and nanofiltration isn't necessarily um, the membrane it's related to the particle size that we're removing. Right? So that's what those names refer to, microfiltration, ultrafiltration. We're dealing with the micrometer-sized particles. Here we're de dealing with nanoscale particles, and ultrafiltration is somewhere in the middle. Okay? So we'll see all those names coming up over and over. Now, the third reason for showing this equation to you over here, transfer rate equals area times driving force over resistance, is that this entire membrane topic 
essentially uses that single equation and we just modify the different terms for each one of the different types of membranes. Okay? So understanding this equation gives you a unified view of membrane, the membrane topic and we'll always just change out some of the details but that structure always holds. And that's really good because if you've got this structure in your mind you can troubleshoot problems with any type of membrane. Right? So if you want to improve the transfer rate, you can always look at that equation and figure out how to do so. So troubleshooting a problem with the process to make an improvement to the process. And you can also use it for sizing the process. In other words, what I mean by that is when we size the process, we're solving for that area term. And so we would then specify our transfer rate, specify our driving force. We would know what our resistance is and then back solve for area. So this one equation allows you to do all those things up there. Okay, and then, um, so that's just saying in words what I, I, I just mentioned a while ago. Now this picture you're going to see several times in the course. I'm just going to uh, zoom in a little bit on it. So this is a wastewater treatment plant um, just back here. Oh, I don't have the details. So this is in Cyprus. Okay, so Cyprus is an island. They don't have access to fresh water. They're surrounded by ocean. And they create all their water needs through membrane treatment process. And what you're seeing here are banks and banks of membranes. Each one of these white tubes, I'll zoom in on a sketch of it in a second, the sketch that was over there on the left-hand side. But essentially, what you're seeing here, these vertical pipes, they're not there just to support these banks of membranes. They're also there feeding the membrane. So you notice this header pipe, we call that a header. The header has a loop coming out and it feeds this membrane bundle over here. Okay? So every second one has a feed and the other, every other one, you notice, comes in over there. So that's the permeate. So leaving, they're coming out. Okay? So they've basically, conceptually what you want to see this as, if you had to draw this, is you've got a feed Q coming in and it's being split out over tens of thousands of banks of membranes and all of those permeates and retentates are then being collected. So you'll have a permeate stream and a retentate stream being collected from all of them. Okay, so I'll, I'll talk a bit more about that, that uh, system but here you're seeing a cross-sectional area of what each one of those tubes looks like. Much like the gray tubes that, being, that is being passed around over there, we've got our feed coming in and this header is an internal header that splits that feed into sub-tubes inside. So what you've got passing around is essentially just one of the, these inside and our permeate will pass through the membrane and the retentate stays on the inside of the tube and then is collected. There's another header similar to this one that you see here in white. There's another header on this side that collects all the outlet streams and it leaves as one single retentate stream. Okay? So, so that's what we, what we have over there. Just a little bit more here on this general equation. There's one term I want to focus on and do a comparison quickly with the filtration topic. So this is our general equation we're going to use through the entire membrane area. And I'm going to write it as follows. Just take that row F over there on the left-hand side, multiply it by 1 over A times dV by dt. So that is our flux J. So J is a flux and that's equal to our driving force over our resistance. Okay? And my resistance R is in fact written as permeability, well inverse resistance is permeability over L. So this is another term I'm introducing every time there's something in purple it's um, a, new, a new term. 
So driving force over resistance, that resistance there you see right away is L, the length or the, I should say the thickness of the membrane, not the length of the membrane, the thickness of it, but the distance through which the fluid has to pass. And permeability tells us how much we're getting through there. It's related to the resistance of the membrane. So these two terms together, that ratio, forms up the resistance term. And I'm going to show you, we're going to do an exercise in today's class on how we calculate what that resistance is. Okay, and the resistance is a complicated number. We cannot predict it ahead of time from first principles. Um, we would need, if we did want to predict it from first principles, know a whole lot of information about the porosity of the membrane, the pore sizes, and so forth, and we don't know that. I'll show you a cross-sectional diagram of a membrane shortly, and you can see that these two numbers are pretty much impossible to know ahead of time, so we can't theoretically derive our resistance. We will measure it in a lab. Okay, so here we go. Here's uh, our first type of membrane topic, microfiltration. And I've got three types of microfiltration membranes shown over there on the on this one side, and I'll focus in on that in a minute. But I did want to emphasize the distinguishing factor for microfiltration is the particle size that we're dealing with. 0.1 microns to about 10 microns. That, when we're dealing with particles of that size, we, we use this term microfiltration. Okay. Now, a conventional filter that we learned about in the filtration topic would not work with particles that are this small. That cake would very quickly build up and get clogged and we would essentially have no more filtration. Okay. So what is microfiltration doing that's different from filtration we learned about earlier? So filtration we learned about earlier, we said we've got our material coming down through a pipe, we have some sort of medium over here, and we get a cake building up on this medium, and that cake becomes thicker and thicker over time as our material flows towards the membrane, uh, sorry, towards the medium. So that cake there in orange builds up, and what I'm saying here is that for microfiltration, if we tried to filter particles in this way on a larger scale, essentially we would, we would really struggle with that. So how does a membrane um, work to overcome that problem? Now I'm going to come back to the slide in a minute. Don't worry, there's a lot of interesting stuff here I want to talk about in those images. But I did want to go look at this comparison here in slide 21 with what we call dead end flow, which is what this illustration is. So the, it comes, the solids come to the medium and they accumulate there at, a, at this dead end. What a membrane does that's very different is the membrane has this medium over here and we feed our material in this direction. So I've got this flow rate coming in Q this way now and rather than having a dead end, I have an open channel. So that's that pipe that you've been passing around. And the solids will accumulate on that medium, or the membrane as we now call it. But what will happen is that this flow keeps those solids moving along so that we don't really ever have a solid cake buildup. So just the flow patterns here move the solids up and away from the membrane surface. And we have our flow passing through that, and that's what we call our permeate. And the material then leaving out over here is a mixture of solids and liquid. Now the solids are at a greater concentration because some of the liquid is passed through, so by a, a, a liquid balance, we'll have less liquid coming here, higher solids concentration, and this stream is my retentate. Okay. 
Okay, so we, another term that's used for this is tangential flow filtration, which describes exactly what's happening over there. So we're shearing away those solids to keep that cake thickness down, and that's how we're able to filter very small particle sizes from, from the liquid phase. Okay. When we're looking at our driving force, our delta P now, it's not obvious where delta P is measured. Over here it was obvious. Delta P is simply the pressure drop across that cake, so before and after. And in the membrane area, our delta P is given by that equation over there. So we know pressure in. This is pressure at the start of the pipe, our pressure out. So we calculate some average pressure on this side of the membrane, on the retentate side, and subtract from it the permeate pressure on the other side. So delta P is essentially the average pressure on the retentate side minus the pressure on the permeate side. A slightly different, slightly different definition there for the pressure drop. Now, I'm just going to go back here. I just want to emphasize this point about filtration's equivalence to microfiltration. And to do that, I'm actually going to go back to this slide from the filtration topic. So when we looked at filtration, this was slide number 21. And infiltration, take a look a little bit over there. Um, we have our flux is equal to minus delta P over mu times Rm plus Rc. Okay, so that's filtration. But notice something It's a little bit different. I've got a row F here. Okay, so this is the only difference between the filtration equation and the membrane equation is this term, rho f. Okay, so that's the filtration um, equation there on the left. I'm just going to switch back here to the membrane equation and show it to you this way. So take a look at the second line. Essentially the flux J is equal to delta P over mu times Rn dash plus Rc dash. Same structure, same driving force. Now, people always get hung up a little bit on the sign. I don't want you to worry about that too much. We always know that we need a positive delta P. So the negative in the filtration topic was just to enforce that. But here in the membrane area, we, we define our pressure drops so that we always get a positive. So don't worry about the sign too much. We know that whatever is in the numerator, there needs to be a positive quantity. But other than that difference, the structure is the same, and there's a rho f here. Now let me just explain what that rho f does. And this is where those of you that work in filtration will get really frustrated, is this terminology that sometimes comes through. So all that rho f does is it converts our flux from a mass flux to a volume flux. So let me illustrate it to you this way. The term there in the orange box has units of meters cubed per second for the dv by dt times 1 over meters squared. Okay? So that's what we call a volumetric flux. When we multiply the volumetric flux by rho f, we're multiplying then by kilograms per meter cubed. And then essentially what happens is if we take all of this together now, so I'll write this in, in a different color, we get kilograms per meter cubed times inverse area times meters cubed per second. We get a mass flux which is units of kilograms per second per meter squared. Okay, so that's all that rho f is, do is doing for us, is that conversion of mass flux to volumetric flux.
And why this is frustrating for those of you that will deal with membranes and, and look at it in your research is that the units of flux are what determine the units of the resistance over here on the other side. Okay. So if you read one journal article, they'll use units that might be those that I've shown over here, which are mass-based units, so they've got kilograms in them. You read a different journal article and they report different resistances because they're looking at it from a volumetric basis. Okay, so it gets, it gets frustrating. Um, I've used a unified set of units here in my notes, so you'll only see it being shown in one way. But then I don't want uh, you to be surprised if you work in this area in the future that, um, and you read the literature that you see different units. Okay, so I just want to emphasize that particular point. <clears throat> now, I think we're at a good stage where we can actually go try out and use this equation ourselves. So I'm going to, I'll come back as I promised to that, that earlier slide, but I'm going to jump ahead a few slides because I think this is a good time to try out and use our knowledge and solve this question from an actual problem. So slide 26. <clears throat> I'm going to have you work on this uh, for the next uh, few minutes. So I'm not going to say anything. I think there's enough information here for you to get started. Again, define, explore, and plan. Um, I will let you know on Tuesday, but it will be probably everything we cover up till Tuesday's class. Yeah. Okay, so TMP, if you're wondering what that is, is transmembrane pressure. It's essentially the delta P. So number one is really easy, it should be two, three minutes to do that, but the second one um, takes a little bit more and move on to that one if you finish the first one already.
Okay, so you must know this, but if you don't, the viscosity of water is 0 0.001 Pascal seconds. That's a number that you should know, no different than you know the density of water off the top of your head. The viscosity of water is another number, you should just know that way. Okay, so number one, uh, the, define the problem. It's uh, given to us right there. We essentially would like to know the resistance Rm of the membrane. So our goal there is very clear this time. The explore part is, again, fairly straightforward. We've just, we've just got one equation that to work with. Uh, we expect that membrane equation will hold. which is, is that the flux J is equal to our pressure drop delta P over our resistance terms, Rm and Rc. So that structure will always hold here for membranes. And if we look at that equation and, and look at what we know and don't know, um, what do we know? Yeah, Okay, so we know delta P, we know viscosity, and we know flux. Those are three quantities given to us, or we know. So what is our step here, our plan? Anyone want to volunteer a plan? Anyone got to the planning stage? I saw a few people had done this. Yeah, Sean? Rearrange for R and prime. What are we going to do with R C? Yeah. Okay. So R C is assumed to be zero because there's only pure water, no cake being built up. So assume R C is zero for pure water. Which is a fair assumption. There's no no cake resistance expected at that point. So then our plan is um, quite simple, is to rearrange and solve for Rm dash. So Rm dash then is equal to delta P over mu J. Which, when you sub in the numbers, uh, let's actually do that. I normally skip over this part in the class, but um, just want to emphasize some of the units here. So 150,000 pascals for the pressure drop, the transmembrane pressure is 150,000 pascals. Viscosity is 0 0.001 pascal seconds when we use that um, set of units for it. Uh, that's nice because we see the pascals crossing out for us right away. And then our mass flux, uh, not volumetric flux, we're given a mass flux here of 0 0.06 kilograms per second per meter squared. I'm just going to put those up in the numerator. Kilograms per second per meter squared, mass flux. And so we see our seconds units crossing out as well. And we're left with the units that we expect. Rm dash, um, let's just go back here to the slide earlier on. Rm dash has units where, that, where they, those match. Okay, so Rm Rm has units of meters per kilogram squared. Rm dash essentially takes the membrane thickness, Lm, multiplies it into Rm, and that's what Rm dash is. So Rm dash would have units of meters squared per kilogram. So just um, report that as 2.5 times 10 to the 9 meters squared per kilogram. Now, the reason why I'm, I'm emphasizing this is because I want you to start to get comfortable with the order of magnitude that the resistance number has. 
This is really important because uh, step four is obviously to do the work and then step five is to check. Right? And you can't check something that you don't know is reasonable. Um, and I don't expect you have experience with these numbers. So this is what I want you to remember. That sort of 10 to the 9 is a typical order of magnitude for a resistance. Okay. So the medium or the membrane resistance here, 2.5 times 10 to the 9 meters squared per kilogram. And so if you got an answer that looked like this, the check is, of course, this seems reasonable. It's within the order of magnitude. Let's try the second part of the problem quickly. So we're going to use that same equation then and I'll give you a minute to plan same equation so we don't need to uh, explore. I know that the same equation is going to apply. Plan your strategy quickly for part two. Yeah, yeah, we'll, we'll see that. I'll illustrate that. Okay, so any plans, suggestions here? Uh, Jerris, I'll skip you. <laughs> yeah. Okay. I'll... I'll, uh, so the, the suggestion is, uh, and it's a, it seems reasonable based on what we learned earlier, uh, to ignore RM. Um, so RM here, we have to be careful, and it, this ties into what Sean had just asked. Take a look here at the system itself. RM we ignored in the filtration topic because we said that that cake buildup at the surface of the medium was substantial and quickly overwhelmed the medium's resistance. So the cake's resistance was really so much greater than the medium that we could ignore the medium's resistance and only focus on the cake's resistance. For membranes, that's not necessarily true. For membranes, we have a medium that's providing a constant resistance and that cake is being built up, but it's not ever growing to be a thick cake where its resistance overwhelms the membrane's resistance. So this cake is being eroded away and also after a very short period of time you, you get a steady state resistance due to the cake. So in filtration remember we said that the cake's resistance builds up over time. So it's a time varying number but in membranes that that's, um, number is a fairly steady number. So when we're looking at that equation let's um, just write it up here again, we have that J my flux is equal to delta P over mu RM dash plus RC dash. If we look at that, what we know and don't know, we know delta P, we're operating at a given 200 kPa pressure difference. We know our flux, we're told we would like a flux of 0 0.0216. Rm, we've just calculated mu we know, so we can solve for Rc. So when you do that, Rc dash is equal to delta P over mu j minus Rm dash. Okay. And then you get numbers, 
So sub in there, 200,000 pascals over 0 0.001. Our J that we're asked to use is 0 0.0216 minus the RM we've just calculated. So 2.5 times 10 to the 9. And we get a result that is 6.8 times 10 to the 9 meters squared per kilogram. So same units again for resistance, meters squared per kilogram. Okay. Same order of magnitude, 10 to the 9. I'll just say, and the other thing to note when you're doing this check is 6.8 times 10 to the 9. Compare that to the medium's resistance or the membrane resistance of 2.5. So it's a, a number that's about two to three times greater. The cake is there. It's providing a resistance that's about two to three times the resistance of the membrane itself. Yeah. Why would the viscosity of the, why don't we use the viscosity of the mixture and that of pure water? Um, you can, and certainly use the viscosity of the mixture over here. If the fluid, the solid fluid mixture is a substantially different viscosity from the viscosity of the fluid itself. But by and large, the viscosities of these mixtures are, are very similar to that of water. Right? They're not con heavily concentrated. Okay. Anything else on that problem? now okay part three is something you get to uh, try out at home and and prove that that pressure drop over there is 325 now I recognize I'm out of time a little bit today but what I'll do is take this topic up next class I'll zoom in on some of these photographs over there and point out some of the really interesting aspects of that membrane something that's a little bit counterintuitive okay so see you on Tuesday and hope you have a good Thanksgiving